Hey, how's it going? Hey, Keith, how are you? Oh. Um, so there are snacks over here for the break. There are hooks in the back that you guys can prove and take with you. As a little, uh, you know, token of coming out here and sharing some time with us. Uh, so I appreciate everyone here because this is what we're trying to do is get back to an in-person culture in Novak, meet a little more uh, together, share stories, whatnot. So yeah. this is a great this is a great opportunity. I appreciate all of you coming out here. We are going to carry obviously the online streaming part of this as well. So I appreciate everyone online uh, who's joined us. So it's all good. Um, uh, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Then we'll get started here. Come on in. Welcome. Um, I say Saeed, right? Yes. Oh, welcome. I want to shake your hand. I'm, I'm a, you're, you're an amazing hero. I really have to. I'm going to call you out tonight. I hope you don't mind. This guy's me. Go get You could crunch. So we're going to kind of continue the way we normally do, where I have a few minutes to talk to you about Novak News, some upcoming opportunities, kind of our successes, what, where we've been, what we've been doing. And uh, we'll take a break, and then we'll have a featured speaker of the night talk to you about. In this, in this case, Black Wolves, super cool topic, uh, and I'm looking forward to that as well. So uh, we will get started uh, and continue. So this is kind of an agenda. We'll talk about. I mean, you guys tell us about what you've done this past month, uh, observing-wise. Uh, planets are in opposition. There's a lot of crazy cool things to look at, so I want to hear some stories. Um, we'll, we'll show you some of our outreach successes, as well as kind of highlight some opportunities for you this month. We always look about three to four weeks out, so I'll share that with you. Don't forget, we have an observing challenge out there. I am actually going to start mine tonight. Because some of it is full moon oriented, and I think I can get a few off, check off the list. So uh, I'll talk to you about that. And uh, a couple of business items that I want to mention to you. We do have elections coming up in December, but now it's the time for you to think about whether you want to serve in a capacity like being, like being what I'm doing here or any of the other officer director positions. Uh, all of those are up for re-election every year, which is a good thing for the club. And I encourage you to take a look and think about it. All right, next, let's go to the next slide. All right, so observing reports. Uh, first thing we do is kind of welcome new members. I know Prasad, you're kind of a new member in the back. That's fantastic. And Shannon made me as well. Uh, so we have a couple of new folks here. Uh, you're welcome to tell us anything about you if you like, but I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot either. But uh, um, over to you, kind of put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, everyone. My name is Shannon. Um, I'm actually a sophomore in college. So, um, I'm going to be new to astronomy. Um, I'm actually taking a course at NOVA in the big town. I find it really interesting, but it's online. So, I get to kind of immerse myself in person. Really Thanks for talking. Appreciate it, Shannon. Brazad, I know you're new as of a few days ago, right? Yeah, um, long time Fairfax County resident. Finally, got an opportunity. No, I can feel the forward. Ah, quite so. Anybody online that wants to give us a 20 second story on themselves, if you're new members, you certainly welcome it. Not, you don't have to, but uh, we're glad you're part of our group tonight. Hey, Marcy. Just have a couple other folks here. Okay, observing reports. Uh, there's got to be some exciting news about planetary observations somewhere in this room. Does anybody want to offer up some observing successes? I know, Cal, you have. <laughs> anybody online? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jupiter is a, is a really treat to see now because it's huge. So even low power, you can see a lot of detail. So last night I was out looking at Jupiter with my 130. George, you're muted. We can't hear you. No, I'm not. I, <laughs> oh, I, can, I can hear George. Can you hear me? I can hear yeah, you. We okay. <laughs> anyway, I was out with my 130 millimeter refractor, and I let it cool down. So the cooling was virtually complete. And the, the view was magnificent. I couldn't, the belts on Jupiter, where everything stood out sharper. The, the image was sharper than sharp. 
I've never seen anything quite like that. I couldn't stop looking at it, even after I looked at the belts, the North Equatorial, South Equatorial belt, yeah. South Everett belt, the red spot was on, the satellites were doing things, the, the shadow of Europa was on, and uh, Io went behind Jupiter, so it was an occultation, and then the, the Europa, uh, Europa erupted, it came back out of, out of transit, it was a transit egress, so it was a really neat thing to see. The other neat thing that I've been looking at, this is all in the driveway, is sunspots and uh, prominences. So I took my solar telescopes out. There's now a very nice sunspot group in the sun. You can see large spots all down the tiny little pores that are barely visible to the eye. They're just like, they're smaller than pinpoints. And when there's lots of prominences. So if you've got uh, any kind of solar telescope that you can use, get out there and take a look, because that's really nice. Thanks, George. I think Walter Thank you. Has, yeah, uh, been, Walter. I've been playing with my brand new Celestron Edge HD 9.25. I've also been looking at the Sun, too, and Jupiter. The scope is amazing. I love it. Very good. Anyone else? All right. Uh, before we leave the slide, I do want to introduce Sagid, right? Thank you, Sagid. This guy, uh, amazing story. Do um, you mind if I just get like 20 seconds? Because um, Sagid grew, grew up and found himself in North Korea for many years as kind of a, I don't know if a prisoner of or, or, as a Thirty-seven months. Thirty-seven months. <laughs> uh, all the stories you hear about North Korea back in the fifties, forties. It's in the fifties. When the yeah, Korean War started. Yeah, yeah, in the fifties. Yeah, he, he experienced all of those things that you hear about, and he found his way out. Real hero. Got interested in astronomy. Kind of later. Uh, amazing, amazing stuff you did in. Uh, Antarctica on astronomy. Yes, yeah, we went to Antarctica, and we 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 were trying to see the solar eclipse from the boat, but uh, it was so foggy that uh, we couldn't see it. But the people who went on uh, on to uh, Antarctica, they were able to see it. I guess, apparently it wasn't that foggy where they were, so we spent about a week before coming home. Oh, that's awesome. But I have a little video of you in our archive. It's really cool. I'm going to do some kind of thing on the website for you. And I should have brought your book because you wrote a great book. Oh, actually, if you'd like to show it. Yeah. Well, I brought it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case. Uh, here it is. Uh, and here you are. You look the same. <laughs> and that was um, great story about you know how to live and get out of North Korea under the most difficult of times. And uh, uh, I hope we get to chat at the break. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for coming over. All right, let's keep going. We'll move a little bit quicker here now. So I did have a story that I wanted to share with you because I want to bring these kinds of things to the meeting. So I had, I was fortunate to go to a star party out in Arizona this past month. I had to be out there and just timing was perfect. Um, so this was the Oracle Star Party, was sponsored by uh, Explorer Scientific. Uh, so there's me kind of with Scott and Ken of the company, but it was situated in a state park out there, beautiful setting out the desert. You know, of course, it's monsoon monsoon season still in Arizona, so we had rain every day, but the skies did clear for for the night that we were all out there on the uh, Star Party. Next slide. Um, they had some talks, kind of like we do. Um, there was Adam Block and John Adam, and of course he works out there. He's one of the kind of the one of the I don't know, kind of everybody's favorite astrophotographer, right? He's done a lot of YouTube work. That was super cool. Uh, a couple other speakers. I talked with a gentleman. Um, kind of his back is to us, but he has agreed to give us a talk at Novak sometime next year on radio astronomy. Works at the University of Arizona. Well, come on in, grab a, grab some water if you like. Uh, and so making connections out there for the club. Uh, where we were staying, this is kind of just a 
he was, but it was raining one of those days. A little bobcat wandered in and jumped up on the table and stayed about an hour. <laughs> so, that was cool. Um, here's the actual Delico Nebula. What's that? <laughs> uh, so, you know, just like we do, big telescopes come out at dusk. Um, the ladder's even really beautiful, Teddy. This was a 28 inch, the one in the, in the middle picture there. And they had one of those night vision, you know, Greek scopes on it as well. So, I mean, unbelievable views through that. Um, next. The one cool thing they had that we haven't yet had is a live band. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was kind of at the far end of the field. So you could go over there and sit down, have, have a drink, listen to the band, wander back over to where telescopes were. It was really great. Brought out a lot of young people. Everybody had a great time. So, um, super. All right. So, on to Novak stuff, uh, a couple of successes to point out. We did have Stargaze, as you all know. So many of you participated and volunteered in that. I really appreciate the effort. Uh, it's not a small thing to, to pull off. I want to thank Sandeep for organizing all of that. He's done it a couple of years now. It's going straight. As you can see, the people that have to get involved just just to carry it off. Cal uh, is one of them, Marcy. Uh, lots of folks, uh, Dan Ward, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, the neat thing is, in addition to Stargaze, we also did the big event uh, at Sky Meadows where, where Woody does a big talk. And we have about 300 people show up there as well. So when you think about it, you've got about 600 people that Novak has to service that night. And uh, it's really, got, you know, it's just, Testament to all you guys who help us do the work, which you know is all volunteer. So uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, next slide. Then on the heels of that, we decided to give back to the volunteers something, and we uh, arranged with the help of Candy Mitchell and Taylor Ellingson, which is a he is a GMU grad. So starting to pull from some students into our club. Uh, we had a volunteer appreciation ceremony over at the Hilton Planetarium in Woodbridge. If you haven't been over there, beautiful facility. It's in a high school. I, know, but I didn't even have a real cafeteria when I went to high school. <laughs> They've got a real planetarium with with uh, cinema lights and public showings and it's it's brand new renovated renovated facility. I think we were the first in there even before the public. Um, we'll go to the next slide and we'll see it. So we brought out some catered food. We brought out our Novak cake. Um, we, had, we entertained about uh, 270 people of the public that came through and saw uh, the first web uh, presentation that Candy put together for everyone. So um, uh, appreciate the volunteers that came for that too. That was cool and uh, we had a good time. Okay, continuing with outreach. Uh, here's what's coming up. And we do need a little help, especially for the top one on the 14th, just next, uh, I guess it's this coming Friday, right? Uh, over at the Haymarket uh, area, Battlefield High School, kind of a standard outreach uh, program for those students uh, and parents. And uh, it'd be great if someone was in that area, especially, or had the time and, and the interest they could, they could help us with that. Uh, we also have, which is really nice, is, a, is an event at the Blue Ridge Center out in Hillsborough. Blue Ridge is going to become a, a, a new Novak observing site and opportunity for us. Uh, we're literally working out the, the final details of the MOA, uh, which I think we did tonight, Alan, correct? And, uh, you know, uh, they want us there. They want to partner with us. It's a, it's a real good match for us. Sort of out near West Virginia, but but still a reasonable drive from from this area. Probably probably an hour plus to get out there, um, and we'll be doing some outreach out there on the 15th. So the, I think I have another slide on it. So we'll just hold on that. And then uh, we've got two events here at GMU. I don't have a lot of details on them, but we're going to try to see if we can spin up some interest uh, uh, for those two. Unless if you want to say. Um, I have to say that right now, the, the there aren't a lot of details to share. The, the the 15th is family is part of the family week, so GMU has different events for when you know students' families come up, and just one of our one of them is our planetarium.
tour of our uh, telescope. <clears throat> so hopefully that will go well. And then the this 22nd is for is a special event for our specifically geared for our alumni, but it is open to everyone else. And uh, that one has a has a feature or has a theme rather, larger than fiction. So there's going to be four talks, including myself, uh, where we talk about essentially how science fiction and science sort of overlap. Um, and so that will also involve our inflatable planetarium and uh, telescope as well. And so any any help that Odin Novak can give yeah. us would be great. We'll kind of do the standard footprint, a few telescopes out on the, on the campus somewhere. And, yeah. It's always good. We get a lot of folks out here that want to do it. So this is a, these are good events to support it. Yeah. Oh, your speaker, I think, just showed up. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, and then we have our traditional public outreach at Sky Meadows clock and later also on the 29th. So we will have the divide and conquer there too. So keep that in mind. All right, next slide. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> All right, so another slide on Blue Ridge. So here's a little picture of the location uh, or a map of the location in the picture. Uh, as I said, it will become a Novak site, which is really good. It'll it'll help kind of put a little more uh, you know uh, opportunity out there for folks. And uh, so I really would like to show show a good Novak support there. Uh, it's a nice site. Um, it's our area, so you know don't don't expect you know you know real dark skies, but it's certainly comparable to other sites that we have. And uh, I think there's a lot of room to grow into this uh, relationship uh, for both, for both and for us. It's a good match. Yeah. And I want to, you know, Alan's done a tremendous amount of legwork on it already. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, you can show nature walk at six if you want, but if you come for the Novak stuff, that's not uh, at uh, 7.30. So. Hey, Paul. All right. Remember, don't load the moon. It's a little passable, I think, tonight. Um, but it's out there. And part of this observing challenge is to document lots of different things, 100 different features, some of which you can do with your naked eye. So I'm going to check those off tonight when I leave and get started on the on the challenge. But, uh, you know, it obviously gets more challenging where you'll need uh, binoculars and maybe even a telescope to, to identify some of the features. But this is really good program for folks to uh, do as a project and you get sort of you get a little certification certificate uh, and, a, and a pin from us promisingly and if you write up your story we will we will uh, award a couple of prizes to entries for so that'll be fun we're going to run this through the middle of december all right next don't forget uh, we're always posting new material on novak.com uh, this is just a sampling of, of what's there. Uh, Chris does a really good job getting the what's up on the sky uh, done for us. Jeff Ball did a little quick exit video at AHSP, uh, kind of a panorama, um, really nice video. He does, he does I mean, basically professional work, I think. Uh, there's a webinar that you might be interested in, a brown dwarfs later this month. And then John Raymond uh, does uh, a little bit of investigative work on different parts of astronomy and constellations and things like that. So I uh, take a look at what he's offered as well. All right, so a couple of business items. We'll take a quick break then. Uh, we do have elections coming up every year. Uh, the officer that you see listed there uh, serve one year terms. So every year it's, you know, you guys can, can jump in and, and uh, you know, put your name in if you like. The director has served two year terms and there's five of them, but they're on sort of uh, odd years. So there's three positions open this year uh, that you could apply for. Uh, and this will kind of kind of slowly roll out over the next month or two. Then we'll have an election by vote, vote or email ballot in December. Um, existing officers and uh, directors can run again. Um, and one stipulation is that you need to have been a member for a greater than one year to vote uh, so that you have some, you know, connection with the club. You kind of know the, where the where the club's headed, what the business challenges are, and things like that. That's kind of the purpose for having a little bit of uh, tenure in the club. All right, next slide. 
And then uh, finally, I guess this is, I think might be my last slide. We're doing a survey. We did one last year. Uh, it won't take very much of your time, but your input will be extremely valuable because everything that we do in NOVAC is by volunteers. Um, everything. And so we we don't want to squander that resource. We want to apply it in the right way to serve what the membership wants, right? Which is all of you and and, and we have a large membership base, so it's hard to really pin down what, what is the right trajectory for the club sometimes. Um, and so we need to know what you guys value and what you don't value, especially what you don't value, because there's no point in spending capital resources or people resources to service something that isn't valued by the club. So when you see that, um, next I don't know, a few weeks we'll be sending that out. Please take some time and give us your thoughts. All right, let's see the next slide. That's it. We have about 10 minutes for break. So you guys can enjoy the snacks and take a book with you. And uh, All right, so we're going to try to get started. For folks in the room here, I know the mics are hot. So we'll have to have the conversations kind of come over. Uh, you're welcome to peruse the books. And uh, yeah, so there'll be time after the meeting, too. <laughs> Uh, so I want to thank again everyone for coming out here. Uh, we are trying to get back to more of our normal rhythm of having in-person meetings, and uh, we'll still carry the virtual, of course, because I think everybody is going to have to continue that. It's, a, it's, a, got its certainly it's got its uh, advantages, and I think we, we can't live without it now. So it's super to have uh, almost a full house here at George Mason. Uh, it really is exciting to uh, bring folks back in person. So tonight we have a real special guest, uh, Dr. Jenny Green, comes to us from uh, Princeton University, um, and she is an expert in, in the formation of black holes, which I presume we're all super interested in learning about black holes tonight. Um, you know, it's it's a mainstream news topic, for crying out loud. Um, science fiction movies, they almost always have black holes, right? So super popular. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, you know, is a, is a professor at Princeton. She's been in the astrophysics department for, I think, about a decade uh, there. Before that, she was at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, she got her PhD at Harvard. Um, and before that, she got her BS in, in astrophysics at Yale. So Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what her next... Uh, Academic adventure is going to be, um, but we are super excited, uh, Jenny, to have you with us tonight. And uh, uh, I'll let you get started. Um, as far as questions, I mean, it's kind of if we have I burning questions, web. burning questions, I think people can raise their hand and try to try to ask them as we go along. I think we have so. Uh, thank you, Jenny, and we'll we'll let you get settled in there and start sharing. I think it'll be great. Awesome. Everybody can hear me there in the room? Yes. Marvelous. So when I'm presenting, I can't see y'all at all. Um, so please do feel free through Paul or through raising hands for those online to uh, go ahead and interrupt me if, um, you know, if I'm not making sense. In Princeton, the way we show love to each other is by interrupting a lot. So. I'm used to it and and I will I will enjoy your questions uh, whenever you have them um, and I I don't know if you all know but uh, Liz Doshek and I went to Yale together and I would not have graduated with my physics degree if she had not been my problem set buddy <laughs> but I'm extra excited to be talking to this audience today and my husband is also from the DC area so this is this is really fun for me okay so one of the long-term quests of my career uh, has been this, this search for intermediate mass black holes and the tightly linked question uh, of whether we can understand the formation of the supermassive black holes that have been plastering the news uh, recently between the, the picture of the event horizon with the EHT and the Nobel Prize uh, for the black hole at the Galactic Center. So it's really been a super exciting time to study black holes. Um, if I were in the in the room, I would ask you to raise your hand if you recognize the 
the three objects that are pictured here, but maybe someone in the audience can shout out what the, uh, I don't seem to have control of my mouse. So I'm sorry to say I don't have a pointer, but there's one, <laughs> there's three clear stellar structures here in this beautiful deep image. Does everybody know what we're looking at? Large and, uh, large and small Magellanic and the Milky Way? Exactly. And so we are very certain that there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our own Milky Way, which you see uh, stretching across to the to the right of this picture. This is in, in Chile, by the way. This is the first mountain that I ever observed on. And then we have absolutely no idea, it turns out, whether or not there are black holes in the centers of large and small Magellanic clouds. And so it's been one of the quests of my life uh, to try to figure out whether small galaxies like that harbor low mass black holes that might be holding clues to the progenitors of supermassive black holes. But before we get to that, just to make sure we're all on the same page, we're just gonna spend a little bit of time talking about what a black hole is. And you know, the basic idea, the, the idea about gravity that at least I learned in, in high school is that objects are attracted to each other by virtue of their mass. And so, you know, we stick to the earth because the earth has mass and we have mass. The planets go around the sun because the sun has mass and the planets have mass. And in this picture, light has no mass and so it shouldn't know about gravity. But Einstein figured out that gravity is actually curvature in space around massive objects. And so light traveling through space can be deflected because of the curvature in space around massive objects. And in that picture, if mass can change the trajectory of light, then you could have an object with so much mass in such a small space that not even light could escape its gravitational pull. And we all know that nothing moves faster than the speed of light. So just to picture this in a concrete way, we have this concept of the escape velocity. How fast do you need to leave the surface of an object in order to escape its gravitational pull? And here on the left is the sun at its normal size, 620 kilometers per second escape velocity. And if you imagine just shrinking the sun down, so taking the same mass and making it more and more compact, well, it's gonna get more and more challenging to escape that gravitational pull. And if you made the sun three kilometers, so like the size of Manhattan, then <laughs> not even traveling at the speed of light could you escape the surface of that object. So that is a black hole an object so dense, so much mass in such a small space that not even light can escape its gravitational pull. And so, of course, you think, well, that's what a black hole looks like. Oh. And I was inspired in college to become an astronomer because here we have this, uh, these objects which, you know, astronomers, up until recently, nearly all of the information that we have about the universe comes from collecting light. And yet, astronomers were able to show convincingly, really well before I got into astronomy, that real black holes, astrophysical black holes exist. And so just quickly, here's a sort of timeline of how that, how that realization came to be. So there was the theory of, of, of relativity in the 15, 1915, 16, uh, time frame and already almost right away, Schwarzschild thought about the implications of general relativity for the existence of something like a black hole. And also almost right away, astronomers started to see light from black holes. Now it's not from the black hole itself, it's from material swirling around the black hole. And because that gas has energy and angular momentum, it can't fall right into the black hole. It's got to get rid of that energy somehow. And the way nature does that is with an accretion disk. And so the stuff orbits in this disk and rubs against itself and gets hot and radiates light. The light carries the energy away and the material is able to flow 
from through the accretion disk onto the black hole. And that's what astronomers started to observe in the 20s. In the 1970s, we started to be able to observe X-rays and we saw these bursting X-ray objects. And it was in the late 70s that people figured out that those objects were so dense that they really had to be black holes. Um, and then it was much later, 10, 15 years later, when we started to get our first inkling that there were also uh, supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Which brings us to the most important decade, the decade when I started in astronomy uh, as an undergraduate. And here was the state of play at that point in the 1990s. We knew about two types of black holes, stellar mass black holes. These are the black holes of about 10 suns that are formed when the most massive stars end their lives. And again, we would find those when they had a companion nearby, another star, which would dump material onto this accretion disk, it would light up in the X-ray and we would find them in, in these outbursts. And in fact, it was these X-ray binaries, as they're called, that I studied as an undergraduate in, in college. But we also knew at this point in the 90s, we knew that there were some supermassive black holes with millions to billions of suns. And it was over that time period that astronomers were hard at work studying the very center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, pictured here. And what you see is a whole bunch of brown stuff at the very center of the galaxy. That is dust. That is between us and the center of our galaxy, where astronomers were trying to figure out whether or not there was a supermassive black hole. And I don't know if you've had the uh, pleasure of hearing Andrea Ghez give her public talk, but she is a quite spectacular speaker, and it's wonderful to hear her talk about the more than 20 year process that it was to chart the orbits of individual stars around the center of our galaxy. And in this video that they've made there at UCLA and Andrea Gez's group, someone has conveniently drawn dotted lines connecting the paths of these stars. But in practice, the way these data are taken is every year you go to the telescope and you take a picture of this random field of stars. And then you come back the next year and you take another picture and nobody draws those circles for you. You have to figure out, let's just watch this most wonderful video again. Andrea and, and collaborators, they had to figure out which star was which and play this incredible matching game. And not only that, <coughs> they were observing these stars through a tremendous amount of schmutz. That's a technical term, I like to say, uh, between us and the stars. So they could only observe in the infrared, which was always much more technically challenging. Um, so this was just a, a, a triumph of modern astronomy that they were able to get now full orbits for a couple of stars. And just like the planets going around our sun, figure out that the enclosed mass was so much mass in such a small space that it had to be a black hole and a, an extremely precise black hole mass of four times 10 to the six comes out of this work. Um, so uh, we, around this time that, that Andrea Gez was studying the stars at the center of our galaxy, we were also flying the Hubble Space Telescope, which was allowing us to play the same game, which is to look at the motions of stars in the centers of other galaxies and see whether they were moving too fast unless you put a black hole there. Now, in all other galaxies, you cannot actually take pictures of individual stars because the closest galaxy centers are like a thousand times further away than the galactic center. And so you can't measure the orbits of individual stars anymore. Instead, you measure the aggregate motions of these stars. Um, and if you can zoom way into the center of the galaxy, you can ask, are these stars moving so fast that there must be a black hole? And this is a movie that just demonstrates on the left would be M32 with no black hole and on the right with a black hole. And you can just see how much faster the stars move. We can just watch that uh, one more time. So zooming in on the center of this galaxy on the left no black hole on the right black hole and you can really see the difference so astronomers are able to measure that signal now um, for about 100 galaxies and so as i was starting my thesis in 2000 thanks to the hubble space telescope we had become quite convinced that most if not all massive galaxies 
had supermassive black holes at their centers. And we were still busily studying these stellar mass black holes that we thought were all around 10 times the mass of the sun. The next really big breakthrough came in 2015 when we heard the first uh, black hole mergers through gravitational waves. And not only was this a stunning um, vindication of the theory of general relativity, but we were seeing black holes much more massive than 10 suns. We were seeing 30, 40. We've even seen a black hole merger that's over 100 solar masses at this point. Uh, and so our picture for black holes at low mass has grown much richer and much more interesting now that we have this entire zoo of black hole pairs that we are able to detect through gravitational waves. And so as of the mid 2010s, we were starting to understand that not only do we have these 10 sun stellar mass black holes, but we're able to detect these stellar mass black holes all the way up to 100 suns. And we're able to detect supermassive black holes from millions to billions of suns from our own galactic center all the way up to the black hole in M87, which very recently we were able to take a picture of its event horizon uh, with the event horizon telescope. Okay, so it has just been the most amazing 20 years for our understanding of the demographics of black holes. But you may have noticed that there is a giant gap between these stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes. And this is the realm of the intermediate mass black hole. And there's lots of reasons why we'd like to understand whether there are black holes in that gap. But the thing that I am most interested in, I mean, one is just sheer curiosity. Does nature make black holes in there and can we find them? But the, the other interest is because we would like to understand how these supermassive black holes form. Nobody thinks you can make a black hole of a million suns from scratch. And so I just want to walk you through a few of our best guesses for how you might form the seeds of supermassive black holes. We know they've got to be less than a million suns, but we don't know how big they are. And we think that the seeds must live in this intermediate mass black hole mass gap. So here are the stories that theorists have come up with to potentially explain how, how seed black holes could form. The first way, the one that makes maybe the most intuitive sense is that you make the seeds of supermassive black holes the same way you make stellar mass black holes, the way that we know to make black holes, which is in the death of massive stars except instead of making so uh, black holes that are 10 suns, you could imagine starting with the very first stars and those very first stars, because they because the universe was all hydrogen and helium, they were not very effective at cooling. And so they would be very massive stars, like a hundred suns. So you could imagine making a hundred solar mass black hole very early in the universe, you know, 100 million years after the Big Bang, something like that, super early. So in this first cartoon, we make all our seeds at about 100 suns. And then we have to grow them all the way up to a million suns. And so you can imagine in this picture that we should see black holes all the way from 100 all the way up to a million. Now, theorists do not love this picture because we see quasars really massive accreting black holes very soon after the Big Bang, 200 million years after the Big Bang. And so if you start with 100 solar masses, you have to force feed that thing continuously. And if you've ever tried to force feed a baby, you know that just as much comes out as goes in. And so it's <laughs> very, hard, very hard to imagine growing these 100 solar mass black holes all the way up to a billion suns in just a couple hundred million years. Nobody can really do that in a computer. And so theorists came up with a second possible picture for, for making the seeds of supermassive black holes, which is that you don't go through a star phase. You don't make a star at all. You just take the gas cloud and you make the black hole directly. 
this has never been seen uh, in observations. And it's kind of tetchy because you need gas that doesn't have a lot of angular momentum. So it's willing to just collapse into a black hole. You need that gas not to collapse into stars on the way as it gets super dense on its way in. Uh, so you really need to tune conditions. And while people have been able to make black holes this way in a computer, the number of black holes you can make is, is kind of rare. So it may be able to solve this problem of making the very first quasars. It's not clear that you can make all supermassive black holes this way. But in any case, the cartoon is we start at something like 1,000 to 10,000 suns with these direct collapsed black holes. And then we should have, at the present day, we have to grow those all the way up to a billion. So we should see suns as black holes anywhere from 10,000 all the way up to a billion. The third picture is that you could make your black holes through what we call runaway processes in the centers of these dense stellar clusters. So here on the left, I have a picture of a beautiful star cluster. It's some of the largest number of stars in a small space that exist in the universe. And early in the life of these star clusters, there are so many massive stars that you can have the stars merge and form a very, very, very massive star in the center of the cluster, which would then end its life as a black hole. And through this process, you could make a thousand solar mass black hole in the centers of these star clusters. Um, and what is unique about this path for forming um, seed black holes is that you don't need it to happen super early in the universe. It could happen at any time. And in fact, there's some chance that some of those mergers that we're seeing in LIGO are actually happening in star clusters, black holes meeting each other in star clusters for the first time. Uh, and so we could be seeing the beginnings of seed formation in star clusters today. We don't know yet. But if this happens, the picture is you start at a thousand, you have to get all the way up to a billion. And so you fill in this entire region from a thousand on up. Okay. So the cartoon is that if you make your black holes with first stars, you fill in the entire black hole mass gap. If you make your uh, seed black holes with mergers and clusters, you only, you start at a thousand. And if you make them with direct collapse, you start at 10,000. Okay, that's the sort of cartoon. And for most of my uh, career, I have been trying to distinguish between these three possible formation channels for seed black holes, the gravitational runaway, the population three stars, and the direct collapse. This population three stars just means the death of the very first star. Sorry for the jargon there. And we've been trying to distinguish between these different models by using observations of black holes today. And so the idea is if we can just push down to right, the Milky Way is at 10 to the 6, if we could get to 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 4 solar mass black holes, we could start to ask how common are they? What kind of galaxies do they live in? What are their, um, how does the black hole mass relate to the galaxy mass? And all of these uh, relations that I'm showing in a cartoon way on the right side of this, of this figure could inform which of these formation channels was most prevalent, which pathway made the most seed black holes. Um, and so that's that's been uh, the game. And so just to give you a taste of this, I, I'm not gonna spend as much time on this part of the talk as usual because I was asked to talk about James Webb. So just to give you a taste, um, when I started my thesis, these are two low mass galaxies that maybe could have relic seed black holes in them. M33 is a friend of Andromeda. Uh, so it's, a, it's in our own local group of galaxies. And we have pretty good measurements of the motions of stars at the center of M M33. And we are very confident that there is no intermediate mass black hole at the center of this thing, less than a thousand solar masses. Nothing, no black hole greater than a thousand solar masses. NGC 4395, which was the inspiration for my thesis, is a practically identical galaxy to M33. It's a little bit further away, but not much. And it definitely has uh, an intermediate mass black hole at its center because we see it. We see accretion onto 4395. And we think it's 
about uh, 100,000 suns in its mass. And so we have two galaxies. They are almost identical. One has a black hole, one doesn't. Two is not a big enough sample for me. I really want to know what fraction of these low mass galaxies have black holes at their center. And can that help me start to fill in that, ma that's, that mass gap between 100 and 10 to the 6? And so very, very painstaking work by a lot of people, my, my collaborator and Neil Seth and his students uh, in large part, have been playing this game of looking at stellar motions at the very centers of, of nearby dwarf galaxies and asking if the stars are moving so fast that you require a black hole at their center. And as of now, they've looked at about 10 galaxies this way. It's really expensive and hard work. And they've roughly detected half. So if you're a Milky Way mass galaxy or more massive, almost certainly of a supermassive black hole. But as you get to these lower mass galaxies, it's roughly 50%. And unfortunately, <laughs> that is not enough for us to distinguish between these different models of seed formation. But we are going to continue trying, okay? We have to keep trying. And um, what is the really exciting prospect that uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit, a bit about now is that for the very first time, we have the possibility not just to look for the relic seeds in the universe today, which is the game we've been playing for a long time and it has been very challenging, but we could actually hope to take pictures of growing black holes that are maybe not babies, but maybe adolescents. So as they are first starting to grow, the James Webb Space Telescope is sensitive enough that we should be able to find them. And the, uh, the, the data that we need to look for these black holes um, should be coming to a computer near me in two weeks. So this is very exciting. Um, so before I get into a little bit of detail about how we're going to actually look for these things, I just wanted to pause and say a little bit about what it's been like um, as a mid-career astronomer to watch the James Webb Telescope come into being. Um, I'm sure you all have been extremely excited to see all the eye candy that's been coming out and the gorgeous pictures. Uh, but as a practicing astronomer, it has just been um, a, a truly amazing <laughs> experience for me. Uh, for one thing, you know, I've been hearing about, uh, well, it was NGST for a very long time. And, um, you know, for my whole career, this, this telescope has been in planning. And as you know, it was a little bit over budget and a little bit late. Um, a few years ago, they told us it was time to write the first set of proposals for James Webb. So we all spent a month, you know, trying to figure out how the exposure time calculator worked, trying to trot out our very best experiments so that we could get time on this new six meter space telescope. Uh, and then like, I don't know what it was, but a week before the deadline or something, they said, just kidding. It's not ready. It's not ready. <laughs> You're going to have to throw away those proposals. And it's just been like that for, you know, the last decade of, of our lives. And I just, I don't think I can express to you how incredibly wonderful, gratifying, and what a relief it is that this thing works so well. It's just amazing. And just like the, the public has been seeing this deluge of, of images and press releases, we have an archive server, it's called, which is where new preprints get posted every day. And all summer long, it was like, you couldn't open the archive without 10 James Webb papers. And probably a lot of them are wrong. Um, there's been a lot of claims of galaxies that are too massive to be explained by the, our understanding of cosmology in the age of the universe. Maybe that's true, probably that's not true. It's probably 
something more mundane. But you know, it's just been it's just been incredibly exciting to dive into these new data and see, you know, all these galaxies that we just couldn't even detect before. So with that, um, the project that I am involved in is called Uncover. It's a J James Webb uh, Cycle One Treasury Program. And Rachel Bazanson, who uh, was a postdoc at Princeton as a good collaborator of mine, is the is the uh, USPI of this program. And in this case, we're going extremely deep, trying to look for high redshift galaxies behind this cluster, uh, Abel 2744, which means that gravitational lensing will, will help boost the light from some of the very distant background galaxies in this field. Uh, it also means that we'll get, you know, stunning pictures of these galaxies in the cluster. Um, and so the first set of data are going to be all of these bands in the infrared from one to five microns, um, extremely deep, you know, a couple magnitudes deeper uh, than what could be done, what has been done with Hubble Deep Fields, for instance. And so uh, where with Hubble, people have been fighting about detecting or not the first galaxies at redshifts 9, 10, 11. Uh, with Uncover, they're expecting to find galaxies all the way to redshift 15. Of course, we have no idea how many galaxies there were or what they looked like. Uh, so this is just going to open up in a tremendous uh, new playground for understanding the formation of galaxies and black holes. And so Rachel asked me, or I, I was visiting her in Pittsburgh, and she said, you know, you're my black hole expert on this proposal. How are we going to find these seed black holes? And so I said, well, let me le read the literature. Um, let me see what papers say we should look for. And it turned out that there, the predictions were all over the place. Some paper said the accreting black holes, the seed black holes should be bluer than the galaxies. Some said they should be redder than the galaxies. Some said we should look for H alpha. Some said we should look for a signature in the blue. And so I got completely bewildered and I decided I was going to have to write my own paper on this and figure out how to find these, these um, growing seed black holes. And so I, I did this with my collaborator, Andy Goulding. Um, Sorry for the technical plots, but I'll try to walk you through what's what's the most important details here. On the left, I am showing in gray the spectrum. So how much light is coming from a growing low mass black hole based on observations of growing low mass black holes in the universe today. And so we're going to assume that the accretion happens the same way and that the spectrum of the black hole is not going to change very much. The important thing is that if you look at a 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole, it has a much bigger accretion disk. And so the typical temperature of that disk is cooler. And if you look at lower and lower mass black holes, the disks get more compact and hotter. And so in order to make our model realistic, we needed this gray, hotter disk. And we added it to the galaxy templates that are shown uh, on the right-hand side of this figure. Now, we haven't observed these galaxies yet, right? That's the whole reason we have James Webb. We do not know really what the range of galaxy properties will be yet, but some really smart people have put out catalogs of mock galaxies, our best guesses for what these galaxies at early times may look like based on the galaxies we see at redshifts five, six, seven. So, we just did this exercise of adding the black hole and the galaxy spectra together to ask what would be the signature of a growing black hole when Uncover starts producing catalogs of galaxies at redshift six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We know that the James Webb will be sensitive enough, again, because it is so much bigger aperture than Hubble and because it's working in the infrared, remember at high redshift, the light, because the universe is expanding, the light gets stretched out and it is emitted in the UV. But by the time it gets to us, we detect it in the infrared and James Webb is optimized for the infrared. And so we should be able to detect the signatures of these growing black holes. And again, 
apologies uh, that this is a very technical plot, but this is basically just looking at the ratio of the light in each of these bands. So ratio of one to two, ratio of two to three, ratio of three to four, et cetera, and asking in which bands is the black hole going to stand out the most. So the grayscale here is the cloud of colors that we expect for the galaxies, and the colored lines is what you get if you add light from a growing black hole. And so what you can see is it's going to be really tricky, but we do believe we can pick out the signatures of these not not baby black holes, but teenager black holes, maybe of a million suns. And we should be able to go in, look at the galaxy colors and say, these are the best hope we have for finding the first growing black holes, the earliest growing black holes of this mass that we've been able to detect. And that's gonna give us a whole lot of new information about the formation of the first seed black holes. And the thing that's really exciting about Uncover the first images come in two weeks in October. And then in May, we get to go back to James Webb and say, we want to get spectra of all of these objects, which means spread out the light and look at the emission lines, gives us a whole lot more physical insight into the nature of these objects. And so Andy and I are really hoping that we can identify these things. And by May, hopefully we'll have a press release that we found the first uh, teenage growing black holes. Now, an important piece is to ask, well, how many of these things do you expect to find? And unfortunately, again, if you look at the literature, the answer is nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. It could be zero. It could be 100. Um, and so that's what makes this really, really exciting is that depending on which of those seed channels is most important and depending on when these black holes really start to grow, we may need to look at lots and lots of fields before we find good candidates, or we may be lucky and we may find a lot in that first uncover field. And so stay tuned. I hope you'll be seeing our press release on the cover of the New York Times. In <laughs> um, and so just to, uh, just to summarize what we know so far, like I told you, we have mapped out the stellar mass and supermassive black hole ranges very well, but everywhere in between is very uncertain. I didn't walk through all of the objects, but I argued we, we had really good measurements now down to about 10 to the five from looking at the motions of stars and gas at the centers of galaxies. It turns out at 10 to the four, we have one good target. And here at a thousand, we know zero. The other thing I wanted to point out that's really interesting is the fact that we're starting to find these objects in LIGO at 100 solar masses gives us the opportunity to ask directly whether the mergers that we're detecting at 100 are related to the formation of supermassive black holes or are just the tail of the stellar mass black holes. We do not know that yet, but it's a very, very active field within the LIGO community. And so in addition to the opportunities opened by James Webb, I wanted to just highlight two more upcoming opportunities in the next decade or so that are really going to open up this field of looking for intermediate mass black holes. Um, and the first is that our community is hopefully going to build two 30 meter telescopes uh, by the middle of the 2030s. Um, one is called the 30 meter telescope, which is like a next generation Keck and will I'm sure you followed the news, either go in Hawaii or in Spain. We don't have a site for it yet. The other is the Giant Magellan Telescope, which will be in Chile, does have a site. Um, and we very much hope that here in the U.S. we will have a 30-meter telescope. If we fail, the Europeans are, are certainly going to build one. And so one way or other, we are going to be able to use these to, again, just like at the Galactic Center, measure stellar motions at the centers of galaxies, but because of the exquisite angular resolution that you get by going to 30 meters, we will be able to probe stars even around thousand solar mass black holes in globular clusters, stellar clusters in our own galaxy, and 10 to the four solar mass black holes in galaxies like 
the large and small Magellanic clouds all the way uh, to like as far as the Virgo cluster. And so at least 20 to 30 new candidates uh, we would be able, you know, in the first year or so of operation of the of the ELTs, uh, to ask whether or not uh, ten thousand solar mass black holes um, har are harbored by these low mass galaxies. And then the last opportunity, also sometime, should be coming in the twenty thirties, is that we we the Europeans have developed the technology to do gravitational wave detection from space. And so it's the same game as with LIGO, this laser interferometry. So you look at changing baselines uh, using lasers, but in order to be sensitive to the kinds of low frequency gravitational waves that you get from the mergers of 10 to the four solar mass black holes, you need much larger arms. You need your detectors to be at much bigger distance from each other. And so you need to fly your detectors in space. And this is what, uh, what Lisa is going to do and hopefully will be launched in the early 2030s. And then we should be able to detect the mergers of 10,000 solar mass black holes all the way back to redshifts of 10 if they were happening and so again this would be an opportunity to directly see these seed black holes as they are forming uh, and merging and so that is uh, the end of my talk i just want to end on a really optimistic note that between the extremely large telescopes lisa and james webb uh, we are going to learn a lot about what is the mass function of black holes between 100 and 10 to the 6 solar masses, how common they are, and the processes that formed supermassive black holes. And I would be happy to uh, stop now and take your questions. Thank, thank you, Jenny. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I mean, it's so cool to think. How I kind of like say this because you know we live in a very unique time where these discoveries are right in front of us. We have the tool to discover this new science. Uh, so I'm just really looking forward to what you learn here in the next uh, couple of months, and uh, we'll follow follow the track there. Uh, let's go. So I like people to ask their questions. Let's go. I don't know, uh, Rob. It looks like I'll open up the the chat box, and we'll see. So George has got his hand up. George, let's see. George, go check. Yep. Okay. How we're doing that, George? Yeah. Did you want um, to ask a question? Did we put on partial lights? Sure. I have a crazy question, um, Jenny. Is, yeah. Okay. One. You could form a black hole in the globular cluster. Right. So, since the globular cluster is bound, and the stars in it are. I guess more or less stable. The cluster is not evaporating. Uh, as these stars merge, would they? Would the black hole eventually eat all the stars? And all the stars would fall into the cluster, and you form a giant or cluster black hole. No, no. But, uh, globular clusters do actually evaporate a bit. The the least bound stars do leave. There's quite a bit of mass loss in globular clusters, yeah. and they they're they're some of the coolest objects in the universe because they're so dense that you can actually see dynamical evolution over the life of the universe. And one of the things that happens is that the most massive objects, the neutron stars and black yeah. holes, do settle to the center. Okay. And so all of the of these dynamical changes means that the black hole actually acts in a kind of counterintuitive way. If you would have a thousand solar mass black hole at the center of a globular cluster, it would add heat to the cluster. It would add extra energy to, to stars that would interact with it gravitationally. And so it would be the opposite of your intuition. It would actually puff up the cluster and make it more likely to dissolve. Oh, okay. That's good. I'm like, glad my globators will be around for a while. Yes. <laughs> We don't know if there are any black holes, though, in the centers, <laughs> just to be very clear. We have not found okay. any concrete evidence yet. Uh, okay. Thanks, uh, I want to scroll down and see uh, how about folks in the room here if you have any questions. I'm sorry I'm not there with you. It's much easier to... Yeah. Uh, 
You don't want to go back. Okay. Hi, um, so when you were saying that the mergers, there were mergers detected at around 100 sun, um, and uh, you were saying it's either the tail end of stellar mass or it's part of the formation of the intermediate. Um, so which one do you think? I know there's still like research to be done with, but which theory do you think is more likely? <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, the experts, I am not an expert in this in this LIGO field, but they um, they don't know where these black holes are or what's bringing them together, right? They don't know if those things are born in pairs or if those pairs are made through some process like evolution in a globular cluster or some people talk about two black holes in the accretion disk of a larger black hole and meeting up in the accretion disk and merging. And so I would say it's just really not clear. I, I would also say that the number of mergers that we've observed so far that lead to black holes over 100 solar masses are lower than some theoretical estimates for how many we should see if we were catching these dynamical runaways. But I, I, I'm not a betting woman, and I'm, I think it's a little early to answer your question. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Questions? Yes, sir. I have two. One is probably um, maybe not the right question for this talk, but so um, the other is just an engine. Um, one of your slides, you said the signal from LIGAS was less than the diameter, I think, of an of a atom, I think is what the slide said. So are you referring to, I was confused by that, are you referring to the actual motion of the distortion uh, along the, the tunnel length, that that motion is less than the diameter of an atom uh, nu uh, nucleus, or what, what does that mean? That's that they have to be sensitive to motions that small okay. to detect the gravitational waves. Okay, and the other question was, in Scientific American, I think this month or last month, apparently all black hole physics is solved. It said right on the front of it, uh, black <laughs> holes understood or something like that. But the article is really about um, the information theory problem in black holes. And it talks about the theory that wormholes in the center of a black hole or somewhere in the black hole leak information out into space and that's how this works and so i don't know if you're familiar with that at all at all i was disappointed that black holes are apparently not completely solved but, <laughs> but i probably would have been more disappointed if they were <laughs> but um is there is anybody thinking about some kind of signal. I mean, this would be, uh, I, I don't even know how you would detect it, but in your research, is there any thought on what kind of signal that might be and how we might look for it? So I'm totally ignorant of research on wormholes. And I will say that 95% of the work that I'm involved in it may as well be Newton because the tracers are far enough away from the black hole that actually general relativity doesn't matter for the motions of those stars or that gas. And so, you know, <laughs> when I sit down to do a calculation, I'm pretty happy with, you know, one over R squared. Um, <laughs> uh, so so I, I actually don't, I am not at all familiar with that kind of research, but the precision of our measurements is really, I mean, aside from gravitational waves, which are extremely sensitive probes of, of general relativity. Um, you know, we're happy if we get the black hole mass to, I don't know, 50%, we're happy. And so we're just, and, and the number of black holes in 
supermassive black holes where anyone would even say there was some constraint on whether it was spinning is very, very small. So, you know, we have these two black holes that we've seen the event horizon with EHT, but overall our knowledge of the sort of general relativistic properties of supermassive black holes is very uh, in its infancy. So I, I think we're just nowhere near the point of, of the kinds of answering those kinds of questions with precision. Okay, thank you. Cool. Anybody online have a question? I guess we didn't have any in the chat box. Yes, we, we right. do so detect I'm black holes with gravitational waves. This was the slide that I showed of the, sorry, I should repeat the question for people in the room. The question was, can we detect uh, black holes with gravitational waves? And the answer is, is yes, we, we have been doing so since 2015. Um, we detect them when they're merging, uh, either with another black hole or with a neutron star. Or you had to write a proposal, I guess, to get these observations that, that you're going to get. Uh, yeah. how, hard, how, hard, how is the time on the web allocated? Uh, is it allocated to the people who built? How much is allocated to the people who built the various parts of the telescope? And how much is allocated to the general astronomical community? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually get this question a lot. Uh, it's super fun to talk about this process. Um, so there were, uh, I don't know, four or five teams of people who built instruments who got guaranteed time, guaranteed time observations, GTO teams. And those observations have been planned for at least five or six years. So as they were building and finishing their instruments, they were making plans for their time. And the GTO time, I think it, I don't quote me on this, but it's some large fraction of the first year, but not the whole first year. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to those early plans, there was also a call, again, I want to say maybe five years ago for early release science. And I'm actually also on an early release science team. We're about to release our first paper next week. Um, and the point of the early release science was that you would make the data public immediately and that it would come early and that it would teach the community about the, the capabilities of the telescope so that we could go and write our first round of proposals. But mm -hmm. because everything got, all the schedules got screwed up, the, they gave up on this ERS plan. They allocated time, but then they also had the cycle one call. And the, by the cycle one would be like starting at month eight and going for a year or something. Um, and so the way, Typically, this works. So it works this way for the Hubble Space Telescope or the Einstein is that everyone in the world is eligible to apply for for James Webb time, and and uh, you submit a proposal to a centralized repository there at, at Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, and then they organize all of these into topics, and they put together teams of maybe ten people, and we I was on one of them. Maybe there were 12 teams of 10 astronomers. We each had to, each team has to read and rank about 100 proposals, and we get a certain number of kiloseconds to allocate. Uh, and we meet, we, it was the middle of COVID, so we met on Zoom for four days, for five hours a day, and talked through every proposal. Every proposal was read by multiple people, and then we ranked them. Yeah. And then there's like a super tack of people who, uh, I said I said this uncover program was a treasury program. It gets a lot more time. And so the the super wise older people, they merge all of the results from the regular panels and then they make decisions about the big programs. And that puts together a full year of observing. And so we do that once a year. So in January will be the deadline for cycle two. And then you have to allocate them in time, don't you too, because of what you want to observe in the universe. The um it's extremely complicated yeah. and space <laughs> they they write software to do that yeah. uh, with with hubble they would also let you ask for very short projects that would they would not guarantee you any of them 
but they'd keep this queue of short projects that would boost the efficiency of the telescope because if they'd have small gaps, they'd fill it in with these little yeah, projects yeah, and sure. they'd have a huge pool of those. I don't think it's going to work quite that way with James Webb because, um, you know, it's it's at L2. And so we don't have this time that we can't observe when when the sun is in the way. Um, but I don't know. They haven't I don't think they've optimized things quite yet. We're still yeah. finalizing the calibrations and everything. Uh, I, I also have, I guess, two questions. Uh, the first one is, I was surprised by the master solution that you showed for those three uh, possibilities, because perhaps I'm thinking about this wrongheadedly. When I think of seeds, I think you have a lot of little seeds, and then those grow into larger and larger objects. So I would have expected that to be flipped, where you have far more lower mass seeds than you have higher mass, or more, large more Earth. A large number of lower mass black holes, and then that slopes into a smaller. It absolutely could be that way. It okay. could be that you make way more than you can use, and they're all wandering around. Um, but because remember, I showed you that M33 doesn't have a black hole, and NGC 4395 does. Mm -hmm. So if I take my best guesses for, um, how many galaxies have black holes as we go to low mass at best it's flat it's definitely not rising the number density compared to 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes okay. so what i was showing was very conservative this down steep downward slope may be wrong and nobody knows that yet but it is definitely not rising there it's 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 flattish okay. it could you know it could certainly rise when you get to a thousand i mean like you could do whatever you want there. We have no data, but between ten to the four and ten to the five, it's it's not that many, and that could be because the conditions for seeds are rare, and so most of them do get eaten up into bigger black holes. It could also be that they're not at the centers of galaxies; that they're wandering around in the halos of galaxies, and we haven't at all figured out how to look for those. Yeah. That would be a different talk, but I'm super excited to look for those and and the techniques I talked about today wouldn't work. <laughs> um, actually, I, I just thought of another question, but my second question is, uh, what is your opinion on the chicken and egg problem? Which came first, the galaxy or the supermassive black hole? I get that question a lot too. I mean, my <laughs> bias, which is, and just a bias is that stars came first, not necessarily whole galaxies, but stars. Uh, however, um, I'm sure all of you know more than I do about primordial black holes. And um, that's this whole wide parameter space with almost no observational tests. So there are certainly models out there in which you make the black holes before you make the galaxies or any stars. Um, I, I was wondering, um, is there possible for essentially two different um, two different formation mechanisms for the, the black holes? Uh, you have, because for the stellar, quote unquote, stellar black holes, you have those going up to uh, 100 solar masses. So those probably form from you know mergers but uh, maybe those supermassive black holes they form in a different way i that mean i think we all expect that multiple of those channels happen mm -hmm. it's just a question of which of them make the bulk of the supermassive black holes and right now the Theorists who have been working on this the longest, who I trust the most, they feel like all of their models are complicated and problematic, and <laughs> they don't feel comfortable about any of them. Um, and so it's almost like, while we have a bunch of potential stories, we haven't worked out the details for any of them. I didn't get into all of the challenges for each model, but uh, none of them is perfect. So, you know, it's really a question of like, which piece of physics do we not have right yet, such that one of these things can take off 
and effectively make the number of black holes that we need. Okay. Uh, I think we have a question about the launch date. Uh, it says, Lisa, the launch date, 2037? Oh boy, I, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of politics involved in the Lisa launch date that I'm not privy to. I think the official thing is earlier than that, but uh, it has something to do with when the X-ray telescope Athena launches, and I I'm not going to pretend to understand all that. You got to get a European in and ask them. <laughs> uh, I have a bit of a, a tangential question on your on your first chart. You had a timeline for observations, and um, you you were mentioning something about the 1920s, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the accretion disk had been observed. Mm -hmm. think, what was what's the background on that? I, that's there are these there are these galaxies called Seifert galaxies because they were discovered by Seifert in the 20s, and some of their spectral signatures are caused by an accreting black hole. But it wasn't until the 1970s that people figured this out. Okay. So we were observing light from accreting black holes for almost all of the 1900s. But it, it was the bursting X-ray sources that really put things together for people. And then it wasn't until the late 1970s that people figured out that quasars or felt confident to assert that quasars were, were accreting supermassive black holes too. Thank you. All right, last call online. Anybody other questions? Uh... Dr. Green, we certainly appreciate your talk. It's so interesting. Uh, the fact that you don't have all the answers oh. gives us a little. That's <laughs> <laughs> what keeps me in business. If I had all the answers, I'd be unemployed. I know. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any questions, if you have any discoveries, we will make a forum for you and announce them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> we wish you the best of luck in your research. Uh, thank you so much for coming and coming here. All right. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everybody. Great to see you all. See you, Jeremy. Bye bye. Bye bye. Is this the final word for Novak? You've got some great, great, outreach. great outreach opportunities even this weekend coming up Friday and Saturday. Um, thank you guys for coming here. Great to be back in person. Um, new members, Shannon, Saw, uh, thank you. Uh, great night. Make sure we don't lock out with Max, or we should lock out with Max. <laughs> uh, so, uh, next month, we have uh, Guy Brandenburg will be here. will be here physically to talk about a telescope maintenance. Next, we're So, uh,